Oh, was I supposed to be time? Is it? No, it's okay. 350. We have until 440. We have a half an hour. That's okay. That's okay. It would be something like that, perhaps, if, you, if you're really looking only at this, but you, you should not ever do this. One of the things which you can always measure at any point in time is time through the timestamp counter and so on. And if you see that moving uh, then uh, in, in the wrong direction, then you don't do the optimization in general. But, uh, there, there's there's quite a lot of overhead introduced in the in this in the decoder of Exodus six. So that part of the silicon actually consumes a, a substantial part of the entire energy. So for for a RISC processor, so ARM or RISC five or something like this, the decoder is trivial as you have now seen. Uh, uh, but on Exodus six, I think it takes something like between five and ten percent of the entire energy is spent on the decoder part. So if you have fewer instructions, it's actually a, really a positive thing. Mm -hmm. yep. Because the microcode decoding by itself is approximately the, the same overhead for each individual instruction. So if you map an instruction to a, or have a more complex instruction, which maps a multiple micro instruction, that's actually probably better than have two simple instructions. Right. Well, you might not capture that in your... Not in this one, but you can map, capture it in other ways. So. So this is, it's, it's always dangerous to look at exactly one value. Continue. So we have definitely at least half an hour left and material, so perhaps more. All right, so base Joe. All right, so I'm skipping over that part. Okay. Um, so you can actually look at the counters which we have available. So part of the tool, one of the tools which I'm going to talk about in this part is using a website which is owned by Intel, at least by Intel employees, called 01.org, on which you can 
find for the CPU versions various types of tables which you can download and which the tools actually are downloading. So amongst them, for instance, for my home machine, this is the table Skydeck X core, the latest version and so on. You can download this and you can look at the number of events, just that core, not the processor, the process, the uncore part as well. This is just the core, has 445 events which I can measure. So the next version, so Cascade Lake, has 2,347 events which you can measure. So they are actively working heavily in this area. They added all kinds of stuff. But just imagine now, so you have, are in charge of analyzing your program, which of these events do you actually use? So it's somewhat okay using the terminology, so that, yeah, things like CPI will always be there, but that's just a subset of what you want to look at. Imagine, recall the complexity of the machine architecture. But one thing can help us if we can try to find some uniform values which have general applicability regardless of the architecture version and even arch depend uh, independent of the CPU itself. That can help. So we need still awareness of the microarchitecture as we have seen before, but we can abstract some of the details out as a helper. So this does not solve the issue completely and it also means that if you really want to optimize for the last any little bit of performance which is left, you need to look at the individual events and all the indefinitions and so on. But for general first level optimization, it's okay to use some abstraction and to go about using some methodology to be able to uh, analyze the programs. So I'm going to talk about one of the methodologies right now. So and just like with most of the stuff which I have experienced, but this is based on X, on Intel processors. This is simply what what I've always been around with. So it might change in future, but so far it's it's mostly X86 processors. And there's something Intel simply introduced, and it all is you you can start out by thinking about the picture which I have seen now a couple of times that there are certain, so the, I uh, already mentioned that instructions are starting their life at the, at the top in the, in the instruction cache, in the decoder, etc., and they're going to the bottom at which point they get retired. So there are, even in this picture, certain boundaries which we can identify in the picture itself, which are signaling certain uh, steps in the lifetime of an instruction. So I've painted them really nicely red here, so, for instance, the, and this is not the 100% accurately picture, but basically the first, the top one, is, some, is, is uh, associated with a couple of events is where the micro ops have been issued, so they have, the instruction has been decoded, and we have now split it up into micro ops. And if it doesn't make any progress, then there are perhaps there are some resources which are missing. Then we have the line, the second line, where the micro ops is going to be executed or it has been determined that the resources are available and we can do this so there's an event called new ops executed so that's the one event which we can potentially think about being counted there and at the bottom there's another event which we can count new ops uh, retired this is basically when it is done when all of the operations for the instruction have been done at that level we might be able to count something like that so this is starting the starting point of a methodology. So if we are thinking about it, the, all of the CPUs in a similar fashion and try to identify parts of the program which are counting high level abstract, or more abstract events than the individual events the CPUs are providing with, we can come up with something. And Intel, so a specific in, uh, uh, engineer at Intel, Ahmed Yassin, has to, has actually written the paper. I'm not sure whether he actually was the one who developed this because I know about the terminology has been, been used inside Intel for a very long time. So I've seen people using it, but when I ask about well, whether I can have access to that, they were just smiling. So the publication of this paper was after the smiling incidences. And so here's the re reference uh, 
uh, reference to the, the publication, which you can find out. So it's in general called, um, well, top-down method, uh, TMAM is what they're always, oftentimes calling out. And this is one of the figures out from this uh, specific um, uh, paper itself. That's a nice summary. So what this shows us for is that it's a top-down analysis where we are looking at the question about the program execution and so on at the top, and then we're we're successively asking as individual questions. So, for instance, is it front-end found? Is it, is the uh, program hindered by bad, spec uh, bad speculation? Is the instruction successfully running through? Is it being retired, or is it a problem in the back end? So that's the first level of questions we can see. And depending on what the answer is for this, then we can go down and say, well, for instance, if it's front-end found, well, what is the problem with that? Is it a latency that the decoder, for instance, doesn't get enough instructions? Or is it the bandwidth? So that we have far too few, have far too many instructions, so it's overwhelming us, etc. So these kind of things are going to be looked at successively. You see here we have four levels of, of potentially four levels of different events which we are going to be looking at and that's this top-down method which is first of all being advertised by them and also we have tools now implementing them to some extent. So each of these levels have different ways of how we are actually getting to the answer for that. So for instance for the first level the way the paper specifically is uh, telling us we are computing this is, well, we are first measuring how many, whether um, um, micro ops were allocated or not. Depending on this answer, we are looking either at whether they have been retired or not, or whether there have been any backend stops. So with these different types of questions, we can then categorize a specific event in one of these four classes and then increment account and overall give perhaps then statistics saying, oh yeah, in so and so many cases inside the program, it was front-end bound, back-end bound, etc. So it's not that everything, the entire program is just saying one for, for this one event. This is simply a counting thing. It's a statistical thing by itself as well. So this is one nice methodology. We can basically be, be applied by everyone if you're following this. And you still get a lot of value out of it, even if the microarchitecture is changing dramatically. Whether you are then later on interpreting the numbers correctly and making the, the correct changes to your program, that's a different question. But at least you can analyze things. So how would this look like? So for there, there are various ways of doing this. So Perf itself, as you can see later on in the example, has some of that built in. But there's another tool which I will show you later on, which has, has the much more complete implementation of the top-down model in, in it, which is using Perform itself. But basically, all of them have some form of coding of, for instance, what does it mean for retiring? So how do I compute this value? If I have uh, all these kind of performance counters, which of them do I have to measure to actually get to the point that I can make, an, uh, make a decision about how many times or what percentage of time was the problem in, well, w w did the, the program really reasonably retire instruction and therefore there was not really a performance issue. And these values are computed using formulas. But the important thing is they are varying potentially depending on the microarchitecture. They will definitely vary across uh, CPU architectures as well. But even in microarchitectures, with the number of counters being added and changed, etc., so all of the counters which are not architected are not promised by the CPU manufacturers to exist in the next revision. So all of them can change, but therefore it's important to get to the point that you have a formulation of what kind of counter value, or more importantly in many cases like this, what kind of ratio, so again, look at the term, retiring is actually a ratio, How, which ratio uh, gets actually computed in which way. So, and the, the uh, 0.01.org uh, site, which I mentioned before, has data files for many of these architectures, and here again, that's for my, my Skylake machine at home, this would be the way 
how I compute retiring, or the tools are computing the retiring value. So it takes, retiring is the number of MIOPS which are retired divided by the slots. The slots is pipeline width times core clocks. Core clocks is depending on how I will do these sampling and so on, is computed in one of three ways. And clocks is computed this way, etc., etc. So this is written as a kind of code. Gets executed and based on the sampling values which I have available, I can compute this value. And this is available for all kinds of different parts of this top-down model and more. So there are actually many, many more ratios defined in the Intel manual, so I have this in the, in the end a little bit, uh, which we can use to utilize for our program analysis, but for the top-down analysis, we just need a couple of these kind of things, and they are defined depending on the CPU architecture by these nice little files which we can automatically use. So that's good news. So we don't really have to do that much work. So the tool which I've mentioned, uh, which has this, is called PMU tool. So for those who are around in the Linux world, uh, no Andy Clean. Uh, Andy has been working for Intel for quite a number of years now, and he has published this as an implementation of the top-down paper. It's a Python script or a set of Python scripts, and it's actually really nice. And the tool itself is using the data which you can download yourself independently from the 01.org site. So the Perfmon directory has all these kind of files for all kinds of archi uh, CPU architectures. They're available. So how do you use it? In Perf itself, as I mentioned, it has an initial version of this available coded by uh, inside, but only the level one. Remember, there were four levels. Level one is available in Perf itself. You specify the top-down argument, but you also have to do global counting using the dash A argument. And that's not bad, it's, a, it's kind of a bad thing because this means you cannot uh, monitor an individual process. You have to look at the entire, pro, uh, entire running system and if it's noisy, if there are many other things going on, you have to be carefully interpreting the data. But you can do something around these kind of things. For instance, you can uh, tie the, the process which you're looking at to an individual core. For instance, in this case, task set dash C0 means that the process will always be executed in core 0. So you only have to look in the output at the, at the line S0, socket 0, core 0. My counts will only be in this line, not in this line. Otherwise, it might be confusing. So why are these different numbers? They don't apply to my code, etc. So you, you have to work around some of the limitations of perf. So in general, I, I've never been really used that. I've used the top left tool, which is part of this PMU tool set. It's a Python script, as the name suggests. So you run it, and it, you can give it parameters. For instance, in this case, I can tell it, oh yeah, this is a single thread program. So don't worry about setting up performance monitoring on all kinds of cores, only on the core I'm actually going to use, and therefore it's much, much simpler than what you would normally get. And then, so in this case here, I just run level one analysis on the, on the program, and as you can see it here, the numbers are actually pretty good corresponding. So you see backend bound 20.2%, that's the red line, and here it is 20.95%, also, this is the output. It doesn't even bother pointing out that there's front-end bound and retiring and so on. It, it immediately figured out that's the potential problem if there is any. Exactly what the red color here shows. So they're basically equivalent at that level. But PMU tools and specific top left, you can ask other levels. So now I specify level two. So it runs the level one test and the level two tests. And here I also told it, oh yeah, don't use multiplexing. Think back, what do I mean by multiplexing? I, I'm not repeating this because I'm out of time, but you know this now, what this means. This means that I have to run the program multiple times. So now it says here, run one of six, up to run six of six, because it doesn't do multiple performance measurement counters at the same time, it does them in different runs. Which is always a good thing for you to do if A, the program is repeatable, and B, it doesn't run for days before you can actually do something. So if it runs in a reasonable amount of time, I always do this because the precision is so much higher. So in this case, so you do this and you get the second level analysis, which is not only BE, means backend bound, but specifically BE dash core or slash core, backend bound, it's core bound. 
and you can go back to the picture itself and see what this actually means, what the next level is, etc. etc. You can do this up to level four, and then gives it's another mode where it does all kinds of other things as well. So this kind of thing already exists, you don't have to write anything, you just have to interpret the numbers appropriately. And that's not as easy as well, because all they are doing is they are looking at the entire execution of your program and assigning a number to each of these different, for instance, level results in this case. But this doesn't give you any information about where, what is happening where in the program. And I already mentioned the beginning, in the, in the first part, that yeah, yeah, you need also spatial resolution. So that's not by a simple overview. You need to do sampling. And the good thing is that you, even that you don't have to really think if you're using top left. If you use either show sample or even run sample, it will analyze according to the top-down method what your program might actually be suffering of and then issue an appropriately matching sampling command. So similar to what we have before, perf record. But the events which it records are chosen to match the found conditions in the program. So the thing is, that much of the knowledge which you would have to know about the microarchitecture, oh yeah, well, if I observe this kind of behavior here, so what should I look for in detail? That's already encoded in the script. So Andy has done all the work for you. So if you do that, then all of a sudden you don't get in information about the um, uh, the program anywhere at, in, in terms of these uh, the different levels of the top-down method and so on, you get now information in terms of events, exactly what you need. And then it says, oh yeah, in this and this address space part, and also if you want it, if you can use then also perf script to look at in a temporal resolution, uh, you can see exactly where temporally and look locally the most of the time most of the events have been occurring. So that's easily doable in the sense. So you would then just run perf report and as I mentioned before it looks at the files. This is the uh, the uh, level at the sort of at, actually at the assembly code. It will look something like that. It would show where in the your source code the various events popped up and you can look at them. The important thing here is that I mentioned that we have this PEBS, this uh, precise sampling available, but not for all events. So there's always a fuss factor there. So don't assume that because the number here says 10.53% were happening here, that it's exactly at this location. It's somewhere in this proximity. So there's always some form of fuzzing which you have to do in your analysis, but this gives us a lot of information there. All right, so good news is, and I mentioned this also before, is uh, just knowing where the, the events happen doesn't tell us really how it happens to become a problem, because for that you have to actually know from where, for instance, the program was called, or the function was called, not the program. So for that we have now uh, facilities in the processor as well. The processor includes in its state a set of registers called LDR, which depending on which processor version you have, we have 4 or 8, 16, and nowadays in the most recent version we have 32 slots in this register, where every single time the processor executes instruction, which is not the next instruction, it adds a new record in the LDR. So with that, and by having an interrupt and then dumping the, uh, the content of the LVR, we can actually trace back where the program team came from with a certain resolution. If you have a tight loop, well, of course, the 32 records will soon be exhausted. But if you have a function, calls a function, calls a function, calls a function, and so on, we can tr very easily reconstruct the call trace. So that's easily doable nowadays and so on. And more importantly, for many situations, and that's something which is somewhat being ex uh, exploited in the tools today, but not really fully. This is where some of my work comes in, in my uh, own tools, is there's, not, uh, there's another extension to the process of Intel is providing called tracing, PTs, the technology we're having, where they have a very low bit rate recording of every single instruction you get executed. So you can actually record the trace of the entire program without significantly slowing down your program. You record this kind of thing along with the perf data. 
With that, we can actually trace the entire program execution and see by the association of the time event, the, so the timestamp counters of the events which we are counting and the events for the uh, PT records and so on, we can actually associate them and find out exactly where, when, what happened in the program and reconstruct that. It just is a lot of work, but it's there. It's all possible to do. And the whole thing is that as a programmer now with, with the PMU tools available, top life analysis, you can start away with this very easily. You let the scripts do the analysis and uh, you get to the point. But this gives you a global view of the, of the program, how it performs. It's a one number summary for the program itself. But as, as I mentioned before, the, the program has different stages. To be able to really useful you have to create basically micro benchmarks for different parts of the program. And ideally, you are able to isolate the different parts of the program. So sometimes you can do this by uh, actually providing different binaries, which are just doing different parts of your program. For instance, in a compiler, you are creating a different binary, which does, just does the scanning. The other part does uh, just the, 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 tree, the IR, the intermediate representation, uh, representation. The other one does only the code generation, then the individual optimization passes, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can do these kind of things, you can individually profile the, indiv the pieces which make up the program itself. Then you can analyze them. If you would do this as a whole, you would not necessarily know what you are looking at at any point in time. It becomes so much more complicated. So with that, this is part which no tool can help you with. This is something which, when you're writing code, you have to make sure that you can do something like this yourself. Okay, I already mentioned that uh, the sort of top-down methods on uh, is using all these kind of ratios, etc. But they are not all of them. Intel has been for the longest time, but also uh, AMD has a similar manual, but. They are not as good in, in keeping it up to date and, and, and completing it, but Intel has, um, has what, is, what they call the optimization manual. There's a specifically, there's a chapter or an appendix more correctly called using performance uh, monitoring events. And for that, they are listing for different market architectures, ratios, dozens, hundreds of ratios with explanations of what they're measuring plus the way you're actually uh, uh, using them or how, they, how you're computing them. That's incredibly useful. This is an extension to the uh, top-down method. You would use the top-down method, of course, but then if you're really going into this, you can measure even more things. And all of these events, you should be able to get through the perfect interface. So, but after a change, so, once you have analyzed things and you made a change to your program, how do you actually see whether you make progress? Yes, you can do statistical analysis again, but oftentimes the changes which you are making will have effects which are small. How do you differentiate that positive or negative change uh, from the noise? So this is why you usually should use something else. I have mentioned this in the first part as well. There's a set of interfaces called Puppy. Uh, and with that, you can easily read absolute values of certain counters. And, this, and so here's the example. So before my, the work which I'm actually investigating, I'm reading the counters. After that, I'm reading them again, and then just compute the difference. The result is that I can uh, count individual numbers of events from the inside the work which are done. This does not mean that there's no variance in the numbers if I repeat this, because I mentioned this at the very beginning, their CPUs are basically st stochastic by themselves. There are so many different independent events that there is never a one repetition is exactly the same as the other one, but you have uh, absolute values, and if you're measuring very short intervals of time to which normal statistics will not give you a good enough result, in this case, you can actually get really, really good results, and you get sometimes for certain events, you actually have variants which are counted by one or two, so instead of one or two percent, so individual events you can actually count. That's really a nice thing uh, for, for you to do, and if you're changing some code, you also know exactly where the effect can be measured, and then just add these appropriate calls and so on. 
And the nice thing is that uh, in preparation for that, so you have to set up this event set, which is used in, in these calls. And if you do it right, and this is a sketch of how you do it. So I have different codes how I do this. So I usually prepare my program so that if I set an environment variable with the names of the events which I want to measure, I have to code like this to parse the environment variable and program the event set appropriately so that to count different sets in different runs of the program, I only have to change an environment variable and run it again. So this makes it really easy to, to run through lots and lots of experiments. So per rule mentioned, remember that. All right. That was the quick part of this. So I think I've run out of time. Any questions? Yes, Subin. Intel VTune is proprietary, I don't touch it. So, uh, can I do what that does? Yes, ask, ask Joe more about this, he knows it. Yeah, here, so he's, he's reaching I, for the mic. Stand up. We, <laughs> a few years back we played with VTune and working with the, the developers of Perf and Everything in VTune you can do in Perf, and a lot of what VTune does is exactly about two or three slides back where it talked about if you all the ratios. If you want to look at a hot area here, um, look at these events and, and in this ratio, and here's what it means. And VTune kind of makes it easy for you to, to to look at that. All that's available in Perf. And in fact, Andy Clean's tools uh, do a lot of what VTune does in open source. So, your and VTune is a the the three hundred pound monster. It's a it's very heavyweight. So I, I, I so that's anything else. So thanks, Joe. All right. Oh, Tommy. I was just wondering if uh, Wait a do do the, uh, the 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 times when the events actually trigger uh, do they ever get correlated with the workflow or with the workload or can you assume that they're random? No. So the events you're counting certain events. So things like uh, let's say uh, last level cash misses. Yeah, yeah. They are of course correlated with the with the work. No, I, I, I mean when when you actually register. Them, them no, so but this is where the the tracing by the the association of the events to the timestamps and also to the instruction comes into play. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the early versions, they were happy just to create the events of the early versions of the CPUs. Later on, as I said with PBS and so on, they actually are able to record exact instructions for that. And so it's the quality of implementation of the CPU and how much you pay for the CPU. So, sorry to ask you a little more clearly the when you're time sharing because you're you're you have more. You should never time share. So if you do time sharing, all bets are off. Literally, so don't do it. So the only time when you're doing time sharing is if you have a gigantic non-ending process at which you cannot afford to repeat the measurements many, many times and where you do the measurements over hours and so on so that the numbers actually mean something. But not if you're doing normal program development. Mm 